a sort of a less formal event, if you like, at the House der Jungen Talente. And there was this great concert. It finished with a medley of Clash songs performed by Billy Bragg and Attila the Stockbroker. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. <laughs> This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who is our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton Le Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 33 of Cold War Conversations, where we again speak with Eileen Ford Price who was an English teacher in East Berlin in the GDR in the 1980s. Before we start, I'd like to thank our latest reviewer in iTunes, Andrew Cairns, for his five-star review. Please do add reviews to your podcast provider's website. It really does help to spread the word. Now, back to today's episode. Eileen shares some great details with us of working in East Berlin Eileen also generously reveals details about the contents of her Stasi file. It's a fascinating story that includes Eileen's escape from the Volkspolizei following a Billy Bragg gig in East Berlin. We welcome back Eileen Ford Price. Um, so you come back in 1986 to Berlin, which is obviously quite different to uh, Rostock. How did you find the contrast with Berlin and and the the provinces? Yeah, so I mean, we we kind of talked about how there was that sort of um, con- almost kind of conservatism in in Rostock. I didn't experience that quite so much in Berlin. You know, there was some you know obviously much more cosmopolitan. There was a lot more tolerance um, of people who were different or who lived you know, alternative lifestyles. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I had a, for a few months, I had a boyfriend in, in East Berlin who was in, who lived in a squat, um, which I, you know, hadn't come across people squatting in Rostock. I don't, I don't think they would have gotten away with it particularly, but no, you know, no. in, in Berlin you could, you know. Wow. That is, yeah, because you don't imagine that because you imagine the state is, you know, allegedly yeah. giving looking after everybody yeah. and there wouldn't be a need for that yeah. so that is interesting yeah and uh, yeah i mean i think it was by choice you know i don't I, I i you know i don't think it was because he was homeless it was just you know it was by choice and and that choice i say tended tended to be tolerated a bit more um and again you know it was an interesting time to be in in berlin um because the 1980s was when you know a lot of the the the, the big renovation projects were happening so you know the 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 opera house was was restored you know so actually you know all that area i kind of saw it you know when it was um you know in 1983 when it was uh, you know kind of crumbling and i mean that area looked like world war ii had just finished well it uh, it did yeah exactly yeah yeah whereas you know by the time i left at the end of 1986 it was it was stunning (laughs) yeah no absolutely the two cathedrals yeah. there in the opera house yeah. in the middle yeah amazing and and i mean for you know a big city east berlin you know it, it felt safe you know whether that was a false sense of security that i had but you know you, you know walking around late at night i apart from the odd occasion it it didn't feel the same threat that you would have felt you know sort of walking around in london or manchester or you know Mm. So you're you're teaching English in Berlin, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. And who who are you teaching English to? So these were um, postgraduate students. Um, so they were students of mathematics, economics, you know, of, of quite a, a wide range of subjects, sciences as well. 
And these were students who were expected to travel to international conferences. And the language of international conferences being English, they needed to learn conversational English. So that was my job, was the um, the conversational English bit. You know, while you know, I had textbooks that I was expected to work from, uh, I also had a fair degree of freedom and, and independence on the material, you know, other materials that I used in the classroom and how I taught the the um, English. You know, so it was it was um, it was really enjoyable. So you sort of diverged from the official textbooks, then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And and you know, I there was never an issue with that. There was never an issue with any of the material that I used um, in the classroom. Uh, you know, I would bring uh, newspapers from England, magazines from England, use those as as teaching materials. Um, and you know, the the nobody ever complained about that. So. Yeah, yeah. This is a strange question, but did you feel that you were? that these students were genuinely being primed to go to conferences in in the west or were they had other roles let's say because obviously for for somebody to work for you know somebody to go to the west that you know the one of the main aims around that would have been some form of intelligence gathering i would have thought yeah um i Honestly, don't know. I mean, again, as as I found in Rostock, there were occasional accusations flying around about, you know, yeah, so and so Stasi, um, you know, watch out for that one. So, so I, I, I don't really know. Um, I did, I did become very friendly with one of my students, um, who was, a, she was a maths, um, postgraduate student, and and you know, she eventually moved to West Berlin. Certainly, if if some of them were being primed for you know jobs in secu- in security, I'm fairly sure that she wasn't. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Just it's yeah. difficult without you know yeah. um, seeing these people. But uh, yeah. you know, um, so when you were in uh, East Berlin, did you cross over to West Berlin at any time? I did. I I went almost every Friday I went over. So I had a, a class which I taught, which started at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so I was finished teaching by um, eight o'clock. So I would go over on Fridays. Very excitingly, I would I would go and I would buy some French fries. That was, that was my treat on a Friday. <laughs> um, <laughs> And You're also, living it up in West Berlin I was on French fries. Absolutely living it up in West Berlin. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I would go. I would go over on Friday. You know, finish finish my teaching. You know, go across at um, Friedrichstrasse. Go and buy some chips. Um, go to the record shops. Um, you know, go and buy some newspapers. And and I went back and forward so frequently that the the border guards started to to recognise me. And um, you know, there was almost oh, you again. And um and they most of the time they would just turn a blind eye to, you know, newspapers and magazines that I would be bringing back. Um, you know, I could just stuff them in a bag, they'd have a, a quick look, roll their eyes and then wave me through. So um yeah. I was gonna ask you, know, you about that because you know, they they have been known to be quite stringent about that that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, whether you know, uh, you know, obviously different people have different experiences. That that was just just my experience then, and you know, possibly you know, by the mid nineteen eighties, it might have been getting a little bit more relaxed. Um, I mean, I had one occasion where I was kind of taken away to you know a, a room and and you know interrogated for a bit for a couple of hours, um, which wasn't very nice. But you know, it was only really one bad experience that i had right. crossing the border and what what were their um, what was their line of questioning why why did they that situation take a dislike <sighs> just really all the all the usual stuff really you know where are you going who are you visiting who are your friends you know no, you know not nothing nothing particularly you know nothing that I could give any very interesting answers to. You know. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was 
there was a while crossing over to West Berlin. I don't know if you remember, but 1986 was when there was the um, the bombing of uh, the La Belle, uh, nightclub, La Belle Discotheque. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes, and 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 obviously the the Americans um, blamed Libya for it, um, and the it was on the West German side the 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 atmosphere was really unpleasant for several weeks so um with you know anybody who looked vaguely arab was you know being hauled off the trains um by the west german police um the west you know and the west german guards i mean that was that was that that was a very unpleasant time then did you have your own flat in east berlin this time you weren't having to uh, share with a friend yeah, I, I I did. Um so I I actually had three different addresses when during my time in, in East Berlin. So I started off um in a yes, I, I did have my own flat, so my own accommodation. I, I started off in Greifswalder Straße, which is just opposite the Ernst Tailman Park. Um so I, I you know, again nineteen eighty six I was there when the Ernst Tailman statue was was unveiled. But um, did you go along to the ceremony, or I did? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> tell me about that. What did you? What did you see um, there? You know, it was statue was unveiled. There was yeah. lots of dignitaries there, speeches. Um, so you yeah, saw the you know. uh, Politburo yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, that was that was was exciting and it's still there i mean it's yeah, one yeah. of the ones that hasn't been hasn't been torn down yeah i heard a, um, a rumor that the the nose had a heater in it to stop icicles forming um on it. <laughs> i don't know whether that's an urban myth or not and I, i'm not sure whether you can provide any more information i no i really can't no i can't no but so i mean the the uh, that whole area i mean the ernst tailman area you know, it, it it was it had the fantastic bookshop. That's one of the things that I remember was that the, the bookshop there was amazing. And and in general, I mean that was one of the fantastic things about living in East Germany was the bookshops. And you know, and the excitement when, you know, a new book was published and, and you know, people would re, would be rushing to the bookshops and, you know, books would be sold out. Something that I mean doesn't happen apart from the Harry Potter series. It doesn't happen that much here, really, does it? You know, so 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 you know, buying books was was a really big part of life. Yeah, um, but I, I get the impression going, that the sort of those yeah. sort of uh, how can I put it, cultural pursuits were more mm. part of the life there. So classical music, reading books, yes, community yes. activities yeah. were were more, yeah. you know, part and parcel of life in the DDR. Yeah, I mean, going, you know, I mentioned before lots of invitations to people's houses. There wasn't a single house that I um, visited that didn't have loads of books. You know, I mean, that may may well have been the circles that I moved in, but, you know, every single house had reams and reams of books. You know, it was, it was, it was quite a major, um, as you say, quite a major part of people's lives. But yes, my my, my flat in Greifswalder Straße, it was rented privately by the university and the landlord lived in the flat next door. Now that, that's quite an, that was quite unusual in itself that somebody had, you know, owned a flat privately. Um, and I became f- aware fairly soon that the landlord was going into my flat when I wasn't at home and I was aware of this because he complained about the way that I had arranged the bottles for the recycling that they weren't in the right place <laughs> oh dear <laughs> um so I asked to be moved mm. um and and the university very kindly provided me with alternative co- accommodation in Martin. Oh right, the high rise um, estate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and at that time it was still being built. So I was living in Martin, you know, while it was still a building site. Um and that was the only time really that I actually didn't feel particularly safe. Uh, was, you know, sort of going back home late at night to Martin. 
you know that that it, it had an atmosphere of unpleasantness about it, which I I didn't I didn't really kind of get anywhere else. And then there was a friend who um, uh, offered me a the use of her flat in Prenzlauer Berg. Um, so I moved there. So that was my third accommodation in um, in East Berlin. And, um, you know, so I lived in Prenzlauer Berg for um, a while. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And what was Prenzlauer Berg like during that, that time? Because obviously it's uh, rather transformed now, but... Well, you, you know what, I ha- I haven't been back, but um, so I don't know how much it's transformed. But I mean, then, you know, it had that um, reputation for being um, quite alternative, you know, that sort of people with alternative lifestyles lived in Prenzlauer Berg, that the, 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 the kind of cafe culture was quite strong. And I mean, they had those... Um, I mean, I I loved it really. Those 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 uh, the sort of yards in the middle of of, of flats. I mean, I, I I loved that style of building. Um, so so yeah. I mean, I I I really did quite enjoy that time there. Yeah. So. And uh, uh, sorry, have you been back to Berlin since or not? After I'd finished my studies um, in, East Berlin, in 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 Edinburgh, I then you know say so spent a year in in. Um, Hmm. in East Berlin. Then I went back to my hometown for a bit. And then I moved to London where I worked for Berolina Travel for a couple of years. East so German that was tourist the, agency. Um, yeah. The East German tourist agency, yeah. So I did manage to get a couple of trips right. out of them. Um, and I stayed, uh, so Christmas, New Year, so 1989 to 1990, that that time I was so you know December January I was staying at the Palast Hotel, um, you know so I was there kind of when the wall was coming down and um, you know people there was I mean the New Year celebrations were absolutely massive that year, um, and what was the strangest thing for me was that all of the East Germans that I knew could travel backwards and forward across the border no problem at all, and I couldn't. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was that was really quite right weird and what, what was the re- the re- <laughs> obviously the two states still existed but you you couldn't travel across yeah. at all or you had to go through control to get across i said when when i was there i was there just on holiday um so i had a single entry visa so i would have i would have had to apply for an exit and re-entry visa if i'd wanted to go to west berlin whereas uh, and you know there was massive queues at the border. All all my East German friends could could go back and forward as they wished. So you got a bit of a, a taste of the life that they'd had for the last forty years. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, no, not not really, because you know, <laughs> but, but it was in a, in, a, in a tiny little way. Yeah. So you 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 mentioned you had a police story. Oh right, yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. So, um, I mean, one of the um exciting things um when I was living in East Berlin was um uh, well one of the big exciting events was the Festival des Politischen Leaders, um and uh, that was in must must have been either January or February nineteen eighty six that that took place. And that, I mean, that was an annual event that the the political song festival. And and that year, um, Billy Bragg was was performing. Um, so you know, I saw Billy Bragg at the the Political Song Festival. But then there was uh, an event, um, a, 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 a less formal event, if you like, at the um, House der Jungen Talente. And um, so you know, there was this there was this great concert at the House der Jungen Talente, and it finished with. Um, a medley of uh, Clash songs performed by um, Billy Bragg and Brilliant. Attila the Stockbroker. I remember, I remember um, Attila yeah. the Stockbroker, <laughs> and I do remember Billy Bragg as well. So that sounds like a hell of a gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was great, um, and you know, it went on really late. Um, you know, I was there till about two o'clock in the morning, and then I, you know, I thought oh, it's probably about time to go home now. So I was. Um, I said it was two o'clock in the morning. Um, I spotted that you know 
my my tram was was across the other side of the road and I thought right I'm going to go for it and so I crossed the road when the little oh man was on Ooh. red capital offense capital yeah, offense no. oh, absolutely um so I thought well I'm I'm I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go because I'm going I want to catch that tram and of course I heard there was a uh, I heard the whistle policeman shouted at me to stop and I took the decision to run for it. Wow. Wow. I know. You just, I, I, you are, yeah. I was such a rebel. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I can, and, and oh, yeah, and, and I, I know it was January, February because there was snow on the ground and um, I ran for it. The policeman ran after me. I outran him. I caught my tram. And I didn't get caught. So I, I can actually say that I was chased by the, the East German police. And escaped. <laughs> wow. And escaped. That's a great, <laughs> yeah. that, that's a great story. The, the, Vocos, the Vocos didn't well, catch you. Story. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, you, yeah. we, when we were talking yeah. earlier, you mentioned you stay in contact with um, somebody from, from the days in – in the the GDR, and you mentioned the lecturer, but I think you mentioned somebody else as well. Uh, yes, I, 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 you know, I keep in touch with one of my friends from another British um, student. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but yeah. So, I, um, am I in touch with any? Yes, I, I actually, I, I tell a lie. I am still in touch with one of my East German friends, but it's you know one of these very occasionally on on Facebook. Um, uh, and he's a, a photographer nowadays. He does. The last I saw, he'd done um, photographs of skateboarders in East Berlin. So, you know, I think a fairly successful ph- photographer. Okay. So. And you you also mentioned that you have seen your Stasi file. Yeah. Yeah. How how was that? Well, I have to say that. There's nothing particularly interesting in it, really. I mean, it's it's quite a dull file, you know, mainly kind of mentions, you know, where I lived and, you know, trips abroad, you know, trips back to East Germany, that sort of thing. But I actually dug it out today, you know, because I knew I was going to be talking to you. And um, there is, there is a, a sort of passage in it, which is, you know, an, an assessment of me. I, I imagine towards the end of my year in Rostock. I mean, there's all sorts of nonsense in there. I mean, it it, it talks about me having a view of of socialism, which is based on uh, books written by um, French writers on socialism. And to be honest, I really haven't the faintest idea what they're talking about. You know, so somebody's made up a load of yeah. rubbish. You know, probably because there wasn't very much to report, so they had to report something. Um, but the, you know, I, 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 I did, you know, applied for it about ten years ago, and every so often I kind of dig it out and have a look at it, and and having a look at it again today, it feels a bit like having my privacy invaded all over again. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it, the. You know, I mean, I, I when you know, I knew that occasionally my my lecturers in Rostock would say something to me that they could only have known through somebody reporting on me, and right. you know that invasion of privacy I found uncomfortable then. Um, but you know, as I get older, that privacy becomes a lot has become more and more important to me, and and I say you know just. It makes me feel slightly queasy, mm. you know. Looking at it again, um, you know, I was I was saying to my husband earlier that you know I I really should study the whole file in depth and um, you know because there's, there's a cover and letter with it explaining what some of the codes are and I've never gone to the trouble of you know sort of matching up the codes and the, the information with the information that's on the file and you know I I, I feel that maybe someday I ought to do that so I could understand it a bit better but 
I think it would have to be a day when I've got a really strong stomach <laughs> because yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, yeah. It, yeah. So even though, you know, my file doesn't contain anything particular, you know, of particular interest, mm. it's, um, it's just that knowledge that, you know, people were reporting on you and that there are official records of that kind. Yeah. It's not, it's not a nice feeling. So, you know, yeah. Um, so, so you've not sort of matched up any of the informers to individuals. Well, my my roommate in Rostock is mentioned specifically. Yeah, she she's mentioned in the file. So, um, so yes, I that that one. Yeah, I'm able to to match up. Others, no, because there aren't. You know, there are names blacked out. So, right. So yeah. there's elements of it redacted so that you yep. you, yep. you you yep. you can't um guess that or, or work that out and yeah. I, I mean i've never seen a, a stasi f- file i mean is there information like who you're associating with or whether you have a relationship with somebody or, or something like that does it is it that sort of detailed or not yeah yes yeah right yeah yeah okay Yes, yeah. No. I mean, you know, it talks about a relationship that I was having at the time, and you know, I mean, that's sort of it's not really anybody's business, but mine and the other person. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it's unpleasant that that would be on file. Um, yeah, no, you I... know, so so obviously, I mean, I you know, I wouldn't have been particularly interested in security services, but for somebody who was, you know, that idea that you know, your kind of personal relationships were being reported on and that, you know, there's a file on, you know, who you were sleeping with Mm. is, you know, it it is, you know, it's not that nice. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, it must be really weird sort of reading something like that through a third person's view Mm. Um, yeah. Of, yeah. of you, I, d- yeah. I, d- I really appreciate you sharing with with me and with the podcast. Is there anything that you miss about the GDR? Would you say that, that you <laughs> you think were, you know was was pleasant and you know? Yeah, I mean all those all those things that I've mentioned before. The fact that you know food was cheap, travel was cheap, um, not having to worry about money. Um, I know that most people wouldn't find this something that they would miss, but the fact of having sort of less consumer goods, it, you know, I I quite liked that. I mean, I remember that the, the the first time that I, you know, went back to the West after being went after being in the GDR for a year and went to a supermarket, that was really oppressive you know having like 20 different brands of shampoo to choose from i mean it was it was absolutely hideous um you know and i i i you know i still sort of think that you know having kind of less possessions less goods you know for for me i i you know i i i can you know i i can sort of still see that as something attractive um there is something i would like to mention Mm -hmm. that i used to love in rostock (laughs) um so I mean, one of the things that we students used to do in our, our weekends, our, our free time, was we would go to Varnamunda. So you hop on the the S-Bahn and, and go to Varnamunda on the coast. Mm. And um, in the Neptune Hotel, they used to serve the what they called a vitamin and ice becher. So a vitamin ice cream sundae. That sounds pretty novel. <laughs> I I swear it's amazing. It was amazing. So you had vanilla ice cream, a scoop of vanilla, mm-hmm. a scoop of chocolate ice cream, uh, whipped cream, um, a piece of brittle, you know, sort of toffee brittle. Yeah. But the 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 thing that gave it its name was this orange sauce which was the most intense orange sauce that you can imagine. It was incredible. Right. Now, I actually, <laughs> about six months ago, I had a look on the Hotel Neptune website and they are still serving it. Wow. Delicacy <laughs> of the house. 
And yep. I, I was wondering, you know, with you hear about shortages in East Germany, you wonder how much orange was actually in the orange sauce. Well, it was a very intense orangey taste. Right. Um, I mean, I suspect that, you know, there was shortages of things like that in the shops, mm-hmm. but for the restaurants, I imagine that, yeah. you know, they probably didn't yeah. have you know, it was much easier for them to get hold of things like well, that. Well, I, I, I don't know whether you listened to my episode where I interviewed Anka, who lived in I have in, to in it, yeah. Rostock. Yeah. Um, I'll uh, yeah. I'll ask her whether she's been in the Neptune <laughs> and, uh, and had the vitamin <laughs> ice becker. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was amazing back then, and and yeah. you know, my my memories of it are you know very fond. Um, so you know, if the, if it's still as good now as it was then, oh no, that sounds that sounds <laughs> that sounds like a great recommendation. Um, was is there anything else you think that uh, was unusual or not unusual that you that you'd like to share where you think there's a misconception about life in the DDR? Big question. Hmm, it is a massive question. Um. I mean, possibly, you know, people have mentioned this before, but the there was a huge drive to recycle stuff, you know, years and years before that was a thing here. You know, you had to, I mean, this was, as I mentioned my landlord in um, Grauswader Straße, who was, you know, a bit annoyed that I wasn't putting the the, the bottles in for recycling in yeah. the right place. But, you know, sort of glass bottles and um, newspapers, you know, there was a huge drive to recycle mm. stuff. I mean, I think it was one of the, you know, at that time, it was one of the, the, the countries that was at the forefront of recycling yeah. stuff. Um, that was probably about economic so, need rather than any green credentials. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, interesting you, you saying yeah, that I the food I... was really good because you, I don't know, sometimes you just get the impression that, you know, food was in very short supply and wasn't particularly good quality. Obviously, you were eating out in restaurants most of the time. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the time, yeah. I mean, the the um, the one time when I remember there being the most amazing fresh food in the shops was in 1980, May 1986, and, and it was unusually, there were loads of, you know, things like fresh peppers and loads of fresh tomatoes, and, and you know, this this was... And and but if you remember at that time, that was when that was Chernobyl, and a lot of these goods were coming from Romania, and um, which, as my understanding was, that that had previously been exported to the West, and the West were refusing all this stuff from Romania because it was highly contaminated. So, you know, we got it in in east germany i think that that's my understanding of what was happening <laughs> so <laughs> but um eileen that has been really interesting and i really appreciate you coming on the podcast well thank you very much for asking me it's um i have i have enjoyed it well no it's it's been uh, interesting and i hope your trip down memory lane hasn't been uh too traumatic or Um, no absolutely good good well that's the end of eileen's story don't forget to check out the show notes where there's footage of that billy bragg concert in east berlin as well as other links the show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 33 Don't forget, if you want more GDR podcast listening, GDR Radio is available soon via your podcast provider, and you can also find them on Facebook. If you like what you are listening to, do join our Facebook discussion group, where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with listeners and guests. Just search Cold War Conversations. We're also on Twitter, at Cold War Pod. Lastly, if you like what you are hearing, do leave reviews with your podcast provider or share us via social media. It really helps to increase awareness of the podcast. Thank you very much for listening and supporting us. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off.